Kosick, Kenneth Kosick. He will be speaking in Spanish. He's told us he's a Californian. He's a professor of uh, Department of Molecular Biology uh, and Development in the University of California, Santa Barbara. Excellent scientist. He is works in the area of pr the tau protein and has very important contributions to make there. But he's also a agent provocateur, very closely involved in um, scientific research and the promotion of this. He's developed a wellbeing centre uh, for support for uh, for the elderly. He does millions of things, and apart from all that, he's involved in a scientific story which is fascinating, uh, devastatingly interesting. This uh, minority uh, aspect of um, uh, Alzheimer, this early onset of Alzheimer, is particularly interested in. Sometimes it can make its debut at the age of 40 or even less, and there's a cluster or concentration in the region of Antioquia in Colombia. So this is what he'll be talking about, this uh, very uh, young community of young sufferers. So we're very grateful to have him here. Please go ahead, um, Professor Kosak. Kosak. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for having come along today. Thank you to the organizers of the event, uh, Juan Carlos Lopez and many others, and uh, the whole family of uh, researchers into Alzheimer. Thank you for this privilege of speaking here. I would like to start with a video, a short video, made by journalists of the New York Times last year. Um, my mother has all these kind of changes and quick. Oh, I yeah, we have we have it in English below. In most of the world, a parent starts, and the children begin caretaking. But in the mountain villages of northwestern Colombia, there's a ruthless reversal. People are getting Alzheimer's so young. Laura Cuartas has watched four of her children get sick, all beginning in their 40s. Laura and her children are members of the largest family in the world to suffer from Alzheimer's. They are victims of a single genetic mutation that has touched the lives of a lineage of 5,000 people. Now she's 82 and a widow. Her husband, who had Alzheimer's, died almost 20 years ago. With the help of her daughter, Gloria, she cares for the ones who suffer from the disease. This pocket of sadness and forgetting is tucked among the mountains in a region of Colombia called Antioquia. Here, the genetic trail leaves no question about who will suffer from the disease or when. It's a place where families are just waiting for Alzheimer's to strike. Until recently, this family's disease seemed isolated with few scientists working to help them. One of the only ones who is there is Dr. Francisco Lopera, a neurologist who's been studying this family since 1982. 
Scientists used to think that this family's form of Alzheimer's had little connection to the disease that affects elderly people. But their studies show that the two are remarkably similar and that this family might be the best hope for developing an effective treatment to millions of Alzheimer's patients worldwide. After almost 30 years of research, they've begun an unprecedented project. They'll test drugs on the people here who have the gene, but don't yet have symptoms, to see if treatment can delay or prevent the disease altogether. This is the place in the world where it's possible to do prevention therapy more easy than in other places, because here we have many people with this situation. Laura's fourth affected child, Carlos Alberto and his family, are among those who are suffering from this disease. Carlos has been married to his wife Blanca Nelly for 23 years. When they were younger, he used to serenade her on his guitar. But when he was about 47, the illness began. Al principio nos dio muy duro a todos, porque es excelente papá. The guitar is gone. Throw it away. It upset him too much to know that he couldn't play it anymore. And the disease continues to get worse. Ya él queda muy poco, porque ya la sonrisa se le está perdiendo. El afecto por nosotros cada día también se le pierde, porque él trata como de cogernos, pero ya es brusco. Ya no es con ternura, sino con brusquedad. For this type of Alzheimer's, the symptoms evolve so rapidly that every sensation and function is gone within just a few years. Es muy duro, bastante duro saber que es una enfermedad neurodegenerativa y ya pues se ha intentado por todos los medios, pero me duele bastante saber que cada vez lo voy a ver peor, peor. And it's even worse for them because Blanca Nelly's family has the gene too. She and Carlos are distant cousins. At 41, she doesn't know what her future holds. Three of her brothers and sisters are in the early stages of the disease, and her mother is in its final stages. It's totally different. It's like when you are born. With the difference that when you are born, every day you are advancing, you are progressing, you are walking, you are walking. My mom, every day, is losing all her faculties. She has lost them. Already, her mother has lived much longer than anyone thought, because of Blanca Nelly's tireless devotion. I like to talk to her and thank her for how good she was with us. Probablemente no me escuche porque yo digo si me escuchara me me cogería o me me mostraría algún gesto. Entonces me gusta, me siento bien hablando con ella. Ay, niño, niño, niña la niña la casa. For Blanca Nelly, caring for them is what she wants. If Blanca Nelly herself has early onset Alzheimer's, her three children will have a 75% chance of suffering the same fate. And for the next generation, there doesn't seem to be a way out. Families are trapped by this illness. It strikes them so young. But now, scientists hope this extraordinary extended family can help unlock some of the most stubborn secrets of Alzheimer's. Not just for sufferers in Colombia, but for millions of people around the world. So that future generations, like Blancanelli's children, can live with hope instead of fear. A veces, a veces tenemos que viajar lejos. Sometimes we have to travel far to see ourselves, or to be more exact, to see what we have and what we don't have. Fifteen years ago, we discovered an extended family with Alzheimer's disease. To be precise, my colleague Dr. Francisco Lopera was the one who discovered this family in 1987. 
I met him about five years later in Bogota where he told me the story of that family. He told me of a family with almost 3,000 members of whom many suffer from this disease. The most striking characteristic is the very early age of onset of Alzheimer's disease. In most cases, it debuts at an age of at 49 years of age. And as we have seen in the video, in these families, we sometimes see that it's the grandmothers who are the carers for their adult children. This extended family lives in a very remote part of Colombia between two mountain ranges, the Eastern Range and the Central Andes Range. This district or province is called Antioquia and its capital city is Medellin and the people who live there are known as Paisas, the outsiders. Art often imitates real life, but in this case, it is life that is imitating art. And in particular, the novel of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, in which all of the inhabitants of Macondo village lose their memory, lose their, th their thoughts. In fact, they lose they lost their memories completely and to quote the play with a brush dipped in ink he went out and marked everything with their name uh, he went round the house marking things then he went outside in the yard and marked all the animals then he went round all the bushes marking the plants little by little studying the infinite possibilities of forgetfulness, he realized that one day there would come a time when he would have to recognize things by what he had written, but he would not remember what they were used for. As you can imagine, with such a numerous family, they've moved to many different places in the Antioquia region in small villages like Sopitran, Don Matias, Yarumal and elsewhere. This extended family comprises 12 groups which allows us to construct their family tree. In other words, we can establish the links between the different members in each generation. In order to draw this genealogical tree for the family, we would need as many sheets of paper, so many sheets of paper, that it would fill this entire auditorium. Every core family has between 12 and 15 children. Their blood ties are obviously very close, as there have been many, many marriages between cousins. Here you see some examples of these family trees belonging to the patients with Alzheimer's. When we add up all these groups, we reach almost 3,000 people. But as you can see here, these family trees represent women with a circle and men with squares with a diagonal bar for those who've already died, and in black, those suffering the disease. Each tree begins with the grandparents, and then extends down to their children and grandchildren below. That's why the individuals on the bottom of each tree are all very young, and therefore they haven't yet developed the disease. It is also evident from this slide that the disease is inherited from parents to children and is transmitted genetically. 
Therefore, it is extremely uh, likely that it's a mutation that's responsible. In each family, approximately one half of all the children suffer this mutation. The inheritance pattern is the same as the probability of having a son or a daughter. Gradually we realized that it was a mutation that was causing the disease. That's when we felt that it was necessary to find the source of the problem. So we went out into the field and to these small villages where the members of these core families live in order to collect blood samples from them and analyze their DNA. Our journey begins in Yarumal, a small village about five hours from Medellin city. In Yarumal, we got all the families to meet at the health center in order to explain to them that the cause, the root cause of their illness was genetic. This was a very important step because the community had developed all sorts of superstitions. For instance, some believed that they could catch the disease if they touched a particular tree. The problem was that nobody knew which tree. After we finished our talk and we explained to them that it was possible to acquire the mutation in only 50% of the cases, a gentleman in the front row made a comment. Mm, he said, well, you know, we have large families in this area, maybe around 12 per family. So I would like to thank the other families who have as many as eight families of their 12 children ill because we have only three in my family. For us, his comment was really a very intuitive interpretation. It was His interpretation meant was if someone had who had won the lottery was expressing his gratitude to those who had lost it. Back in Medellin, the regional capital for Antioquia, we had a meeting with the people affected and who live in the area. Medellin, Medellin is a beautiful city in the Abura Valley and it's known as the city of eternal spring. On the outskirts of Medellin, on the hillsides, the city has extended out through small uh, communities that are similar to the favelas or shanty towns of Brazil. That's where the families we are studying live. As in Yarumel, we also brought the families together in Medellin to explain the disease to them. In this photo we can see my friend Dr. Lopera, the director of the neuroscience group at Antioquia University. The lady in the wheelchair is suffering from Alzheimer and it's her granddaughter with her. Without any kind of advanced health system, relatives have to look after their, their patients without any professional assistance. They have to keep the patients in the, with the rest of the family instead of sending them to special isolated centers like residences for the elderly. So that means that young children in Colombia are sharing with their grandparents this same chapter in their lives. On the other hand, countries such as ours, United States or Spain, our goal seems more to make patients with dementia much more invisible from our day-to-day -day life. After spending some time in Medellin, we traveled to Angostura, 
that trip was just like Marlowe's voyage in the novel by Joseph Conrad, The, the Heart of Darkness. This town, this village, is one of the few spaces a few places in Colombia that my friends wouldn't let me visit because of the problems with the guerrilla, with the guerrilla fighters. Nonetheless, the original source of this fa these families is Angostura. And still today, we can see soldiers patrolling the area. This is a photograph of one of the streets in Angostura. And here you see our nurse taking a blood sample. And at the bottom, one of the Alzheimer patients completing a neuropsychological test. The person that everybody knows in Angostura is Padre Marianito. Father Mariano that you can see in this photograph. There's a constant pilgrimage to the cathedral in Angostura to pray for their health. People in the country are very religious but they also share a lot of superstitions. And one of the difficulties that we find in the field is that we have to compete with an atmosphere shrouded in a, myth in a mythology in which there are other professionals acting in parallel with the physicians. These witch doctors. In Angostura we also met with the uh, relatives and the sufferers to explain the disease. Sometimes we've seen that people with Alzheimer's disease are stigmatized. For example, some people believe that it's possible to contract the disease from touching a patient. It's very important to dispel these myths. We also, we also wanted to propose that to these families the possibility of taking part in a clinical trial with a safe medicine but of unknown efficacy. It's very important to prepare the community for when that drug becomes available. These families are ideal for a preventive study because we know exactly the age of onset of Alzheimer's disease in this population. On average, the age is around 49 years of age with a minimum margin. In addition, it's possible to detect s small symptoms four to five years earlier than starting to d develop Alzheimer's disease. This is the ideal moment in which to begin the preventive treatment. One interesting statistical datum is that the patients with Alzheimer in Colombia live 10 years uh, with the disease, both in Colombia and in the United States and Spain, despite the fact that medicine is much more advanced in our countries. At the beginning of our research, we were not sure about the diagnosis for our patients. The question was whether this was, in fact, Alzheimer's disease or some other kind of dementia. The only way to confirm the diagnosis was to examine their brains under a microscope. Here you can see two brains, both hemispheres. Each of them has gyruses, but the brain in the case of the Alzheimer's patient, you can see that the gyruses are much narrower. That means that there's more space between the gyruses and that's why it looks darker. On the other side, in the normal brain, well, normal? It's not exactly normal because this person has died. For the definitive diagnosis, we need a microscopic analysis of the tissue, such as we can see here. The two main characteristics of a sick tissue are the senile plates and the neurofibular tangles. 
when both of these are present in a large number, then we say that it's Alzheimer's case. When the first patient died, we saw the possibility of confirming the diagnosis. However, to do so, we needed to examine her brain under the microscope. Almost all the members, almost all her relatives, ag agreed to allow us to perform an autopsy. But one of her sons was doubtful. Although he came from a family with very limited resources, he, he wore expensive designer clothes and gold jewellery. We suspected he might be a hired killer. So we were a little reluctant to discuss it with him. But we needed his mother's brain. So we went to the nurse in the village to request his assistance and also the assistance of the local mayor. At the end, in the end, the young man accepted, but he imposed a condition. Do it fast. On its way to the church, on top of the hill, the, the funeral procession stopped outside a small house where my colleague, the neuropathologist, Dr. Juan Carlos Arango, quickly removed the brain to allow the cortege to continue. The funeral continued with the relatives, the community, the storytellers and the professional weepers. And on the way they chatted and they wept, they drank and then some of them started asking questions. I mean, why are these gringos interested in grandmother's brain? Perhaps it's valuable. Fortunately, by that time, Dr. Arango was already in the airport and he arrived home in Boston next day with the brain and so we went to my laboratory to analyze the tissue and we were able to verify that the diagnosis was Alzheimer's disease. At this point in our research, we still could not say for certain that the disease had been caused by a genetic mutation. Shortly afterwards, with the help of Dr. Allison Goat, we identified the gene for this specific mutation. This gene is known as presenilin-1, which is the same gene that Dr. Peter Heislop used, uh, had reported with a previous mutation that also caused Alzheimer in an Italian family in Calabria. This slide shows an illustration of the protein produced by the presenilin gene. This also indicates the site of the mutation. This is known as the PISA mutation. Looking for a specific mutation is like trying to find a person when the only thing you know is that he lives on the planet Earth. Pretty hard. It's a very, very tiny fragment of the human genome. And the letters in red on this slide represent the differences in the population. And these differences are very few and far between. With this data, it's possible to predict whether a person will develop the disease. It might also be possible to diagnose this in illness in a fetus with through amniocentesis. However, there are ethical reasons for not carrying out this test. Adults who wish to know their future can consult with a fortune teller or a geneticist. The possibility of predicting Alzheimer based on genetic analyses has opened up a whole new world of complications. We decided not to tell them the results of the analyses 
because in uh, Colombia there are no genetic counselors who can help them to understand and assimilate its significance. Genetic information is like fire, extremely dangerous in the wrong hands. I remember a young member of the family who at the age of only 24, when I asked him if he wanted to know if he had the mutation, he, he said he would like to know. So I asked him what he would do if the result were positive. He didn't answer me the second time. However, a few minutes later, he went to the kitchen where he told our nurse, Lucia Madrigal, if I've got that mutation thing, I'll kill myself. That was very alarming. Because even if he, we did find he had the mutation, he would be able to live for another 24 years before the disease started. And in all that time, we were always looking, we would always be looking for a cure for Alzheimer. So we have to prevent people from being stigmatized due to genetic changes. It's necessary to understand what having that mutation means. It's important to understand that having the mutation is not the same as having the disease. What determines exactly when the disease starts is still a true challenge. Nowadays, we have biological markers that allow us to detect the disease before the symptoms emerge. For instance, it's possible to detect senile plates in people <coughs> who are alive before they show any signs of dementia. Another technique is to use imaging of brain metabolism. In some cases, brain metabolism is reduced in those people who are carrying the mutation, even though they haven't presented any symptoms yet. This is an example in which we can see a brain, an image of a brain with changes in the metabolism, but the subject does not show any signs or any symptoms of the disease. Another complementary approach to biological markers for the early detection of the disease is neuropsychological analysis. So with this aim in mind, our colleague Mario Parra carried out a highly sensitive test. In this test, the subject observes a series of matching figures and colors. And then the subject has to remember the correct pairs. Mario Parra discovered this simple test is able to detect visual memory problems four to five years before familial dementia presents. For me, the story of the families with Alzheimer's in Colombia is a source of inspiration. In particular, the way they care for the sufferers. For a few years ago now, whole families can go to the house, to the neurosciences center, and speak, spend the whole day speaking to the physicians, to the nurses, to the psychologists, to the students, and to other specialists. There aren't any uh, appointments. It's a very relaxed working area. If someone forgets to ask a question, they don't need to wait another six months to get their doubts dispelled because after lunch there's another opportunity to pop in and talk to the doctors. It's because there are so many families, a doctor at the Neurosciences Centre can see as many patients in a day as a, a private consultant. On the other hand, in the United States, patients with Alzheimer's are boxed in um, into a medical system which just doesn't have room for them. Our, our doctors only know how to use drugs, pills and scalpels, but Alzheimer's disease doesn't respond to any of these. 
So if you are worried about the possibility of developing Alzheimer's, you only have two options. One, wait for a cure. Or two, start a program to mitigate the risk. If you prefer the second option, we've opened uh, a store for brains. Our store it was inspired by this neuroscience center in Colombia, but the goal is slightly different. What we want to do is to collect all scientific evidence that might be useful to people to implement a community-wide program to preserve the mental abilities of elderly individuals. Why don't we have brain stores in all our communities? We have st stores for our eyes and stores for our teeth. Why are the, where are the stores for the brain? For example, the stores for eyes work at three levels. The external area has showcases displaying uh, glasses, fashionable glasses, very attractively presented, very welcoming. On the other hand, in a hospital, there is no, no fear uh, of entering. If you go a little further into the store, there's an optometrist waiting to measure your visual acuity. But in this second circle either, there's no threat for health. It's not until you reach the innermost circle that you find the serious medical conditions, such as glaucoma or an optic nerve tumour. We propose a similar structure for these stores for the brain. On, on the outermost circle, we would have cognitive games, memory challenges, and entertaining puzzles. At the next level, would, there would be neuropsychologists measuring mental ability. And it wouldn't be until we reach the innermost circle that patients would have to deal with the neurological conditions such as Alzheimer. A program to mitigate risk includes two aspects, a medical aspect and a lifestyle aspect. The plan to reduce medical risks is extremely simple. None of the steps is any surprise. First step is to control blood pressure check the levels of sugar and fat in the blood. Everybody should know what their values are. The plan to reduce lifestyle risks is also very simple. There are five steps in this plan. Physical exercise, a balanced diet, keep the mind active, reduce stress levels, and last, uh, number five, perhaps the most interesting one, have a lot of friends. It's notable that the social isolation of the elderly is very, very common. Stores for the brain are an economic model and it relocates the, the medical clinics and the hospitals and puts them in places that are much more accessible and much more welcoming. But now let's go back to Colombia where the problem is imminent. With so many people affected by Alzheimer's disease and in addition so many more people carrying the mutation it's like being in a living laboratory. After many years of working with Dr. Lopera Families are now beginning to trust us and they want to help us to find a cure. This population is suitable for implementing a clinical trial because we know very well the age of onset of the disease. So we know which patients are going to develop the disease 
and the environmental factors are homogeneous in all cases. Therefore, in collaboration with a medical group in Arizona, run by Eric Ryman and Pierre Tario, we want to carry out this clinical trial. We are hopeful that memory loss may be resolved in Antioquia in the same way as it was resolved in Gabriel García Márquez Macondo by a wise old man who's carrying a substance of pleasant colour. And finally, my acknowledgements. Thank you very much for your attention.